Welcome to the Pod of Asclepius, your fortnightly healthcare technology podcast for the technical crowd. Sponsored by the American Statistical Association and the Institution of Engineering and Technology. We're bringing the technical experts of engineering, entrepreneurship, data science and regulation straight to your earbuds. No fluff, no sale pitches, just important technical ideas described well to keep you up to date. All in the time it takes to get to work. And here's your host, Glenn Wright Colopy. Hey folks, welcome back to the show today. Today's guest is one of my favorites. She's been a real friend of the podcast and she's working on some cool projects. She works within the NHS England to help digital innovators bridge the gap to deploy their technologies into hospitals. She's also developing some programs within the Institution of Engineering Technology to help innovators from both technical and non-technical backgrounds either develop the skills that they need or find the skilled people that they need to bring their innovations into the clinic. She's Emma Hughes. She's working on some important projects. And I thought you should know about her. So welcome, Emma. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Thanks very much, Glenn. So I am uh, Emma Hugh, a strategy manager working at NHS England and NHS Improvements in the UK. I am also a member of the IAT Innovation Management Executive Committee, which I can tell you a little bit more about in a minute. But I'm really, really interested and excited about innovation and particularly healthcare innovation and how we can accelerate innovation to benefit patients and wider society. Really, my interest in this area has been built throughout my career. So I started off working in academia, in research, but I then moved into management consulting because I was interested in thinking more about pharmaceutical industry and how to sort of accelerate their progress in bringing new innovations to patients. And then from that, I decided to go and work for uh, Cancer Research UK, which is a charity that funds research into cancer. And there I was really interested in, again, understanding and accelerating the process of research within the field from a funder's perspective. And then finally, I've joined NHS England and NHS Improvement to support local systems in their own innovation and help to accelerate getting their innovations into the healthcare system for patient benefit. Yeah, I was really interested by your background when I read some of your projects you're interested in. I thought, you know, anyone who's really trying to do something and create some type of change, particularly with regard to the UK health system, is definitely want to hear from you and the projects that you're working on. Because having, you know, worked in the UK on healthcare solutions previously, it seems like a lot of the stuff you're doing is directly addressing some of the biggest hurdles that people are having today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Emma, you said you're involved with the IET Innovation Management Committee. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that committee does and what your role entails? The IET Innovation Management Committee is a newly formed committee. We are aiming to leverage the IET's reputation and also its membership to support key audiences to overcome innovation management challenges. And we're keen to do that by developing and sharing advice and guidance and through facilitating effective networking experiences. Um, So as I mentioned, we're a new committee. We only formed in May this year, so in 2019. And we're planning to do quite a few things over the the course of the next year. But the main event that we're planning is one in, uh, in 2020. I'll tell you a bit more about that later on, if you like. But I just thought I'd tell you a bit about the challenges that we know that exist in innovation management. Um, and how we've come to identify those, if that's helpful. That would be great. I'd really appreciate that. Great. So as a committee, we actually held a bit of a scoping session back in February of this year, where we invited a number of different people in England to come and talk to us about what they understood to be uh, innovation management, what they saw as the key challenges in relation to it, And what we identified was that there were basically two groups of people or two audiences. So you had innovators who were worried about how to progress their innovations and bring them to market and to benefit end users. 
Um, and then you had the other group of people, which were the sort of innovation funders and large companies who were really seeking to understand how they could identify and cultivate innovation within their organizations and then use that to their advantage. With respect to those two groups, the innovators, we identified three main challenge areas. So the first one was for innovators to really understand the whole process of bringing their idea to fruition. A number of innovators uh, or even people who just come up with an idea don't really know the overall commercialization process and they don't understand where to get that information. So that was one of the challenges that we identified. The other challenge was around understanding and accessing suitable funding opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I speak to the the event that we're running next year. Then the third challenge for innovators was really identifying the right people to work with and to support them in, in progressing their project. On the funder side of things, uh, the kinds of challenges that we identified were around creating a culture of innovation in their organization or in the population that they serve, as well as how they actually identify high potential innovations and go about bringing those into their companies. So basically, you're giving them a framework by which to identify these opportunities? Yeah, so what we want to do is help the audiences that I mentioned, so the innovators and the large companies or funders, to overcome some of those challenges that I that I mentioned. Um, and then the last challenge that we identified for those large companies, those innovation funders, uh, was around how to actually manage innovation projects. So once you've sourced an idea or an innovation project, how do you know when to continue backing it or when to actually kill it if, um, if it's not uh, working out? That's really about effective risk management and putting in place the right framework, exactly as you said, uh, to make the right decisions at the right time. I think that's a really key question. You know, there are a lot of people out there trying to figure out how they can be the ones generating innovative solutions, but they also want to be the ones, you know, taking those solutions forward all the way to clinical fruition. So, for example, coming from the data science background, there's, you know, this huge hype around machine learning, AI, data-driven healthcare. And certain types of clinical innovation are only possible using people with the ability to analyze large amounts of digital information. But at the same time, it's very unclear how to manage people with such abilities and making sure they're working towards the right things, getting the right outputs, and focusing their abilities on the right projects. I think a lot about that challenge, but you know, obviously your challenge is much greater than that since you're not just focused on the field of data science or engineering or lab sciences. You're taking people from across a variety of fields and getting them going in the right direction. So it's a wide range of technical skills, you know, people who have found success in their field because they approach problems a certain way, but you're teaching them how to properly vet and manage their ideas in a familiar but distinct domain. Yeah. Um, and you're teaching them to be good at something for which there's, you know, no perfect answer. When you encounter a serious challenge to your wonderful technical solution, it's hard to know. Do you preserve the project as it is and try to overcome the hurdles versus should you kill the project since it just isn't going to make it? Or do you try and pivot in some way to make the most use of your progress so far? Or are you just delaying the inevitable by trying to pivot? Any framework also for helping people, for example, they identify that they might have developed the technology, but they aren't the best people to execute it. So when to sort of pawn off your capability to somebody who can execute it better? Yeah, exactly. And that relates to the sort of networking challenge that I mentioned earlier for innovators. So it's exactly that. How do I find the right people to help me progress my idea? In some cases, progressing the idea yourself might not be the right thing to do. So how do you identify that and then figure out who the right people are to actually bring your idea to fruition? So now we've heard twice about this event that you're planning. Should we maybe end the suspense and hear what this is all about? Because we're a new committee, we've identified a bunch of challenges. We haven't yet figured out the framework or developed the solutions to help people overcome those challenges, but that's what we want to do in the future. So in order to, I guess, prioritize our time, we're just focusing in on certain challenges. Well, one challenge at first. So we decided to tackle the funding question of how innovators can find and then access suitable funding to progress their innovations and their projects. 
next year we're hoping to host a conference on that topic and we will be having multiple breakout sessions where we will talk about different kinds of funding that is available so for example funding from the public sector grants that you can access as well as funding and investment from the private sector for example venture capital or, or corporate investment as well so that's what we're aiming to deliver next year and uh, to whom is the conference open? We want to target small to medium-sized enterprises and, uh, I guess, individual innovators as well. We haven't quite worked through how to go about marketing the conference or how to sign up our participants, but that's who we're aiming to get involved. The obvious way to market this excellent event is by having it on a podcast. Well, yeah, so I'm hoping that this will help to raise the awareness about it. Once we work through the details, we will also be marketing it more formally as well. That sounds really good. So you said in addition to the IET Innovation Management Committee, you're also involved in the NHS England and Improvement Strategy Group. Um, I saw that you're doing some really exciting things with the program. So maybe you could tell us a bit about that group, uh, what your professional role is and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to explain what NHS England and NHS Improvement is. And so although there's an and in that, we are actually one organisation and the organisation leads the National Health Service, the NHS, in England. It's responsible for setting the strategic direction for the NHS, as well as then holding the local NHS providers to account for delivery. In the NHS England and Improvement Strategy Group, where I work, we are actually responsible for coordinating and then publishing our strategy documents. So we recently published in January this year our long-term plan for the NHS. This is a 10-year plan for the NHS and what we want to achieve within the NHS. And it lays out a number of different commitments and changes that we want to see. You'll probably be aware that the NHS in England is facing some considerable challenges at the moment. There's rising demand from the fact that we have an aging population with increasing numbers of comorbidities and complex health issues. Within that context, a number of the commitments that we've made in the long term plan are really dependent on innovation. So, for example, uh, we've said that within the next 10 years, we want to drive a major shift in early diagnosis of cancer. So we want to go from diagnosing cancer at an early stage, 50% uh, of the time at the moment, to 75% of the time in 10 years time. So a shift like that is really going to take quite a bit of innovation uh, in terms of, for example, diagnostic processes and technology, but also will require an acceleration of the adoption of that innovation from what we see at the moment. That's why I'm really excited about and interested in innovation, because I think it's the only way that we will be able to transform uh, the National Health Service in the way that we want to see it transformed. Sounds like you got the uh, the choiciest assignment working with the innovators and getting to see a lot of that development. Did you want to say anything with regard to what the frontline NHS is and what that has to do with your current project? Just to provide that definition or distinction between what we do as a central organization and what people who are on the front line of the NHS do doctors and nurses and people who are running the hospitals. And those are the people that we term the frontline NHS. And as a central national organisation, we are there to, uh, like I said, um, set the strategic direction for all of those frontline providers and also to support them to achieve the ambitions that we set. But actually, we set those ambitions collaboratively with the frontline NHS when we develop our strategy documents. So it's definitely not an ivory tower situation. You had talked about accelerating the uh, application of these new technologies and the deployment of these new technologies into the NHS. How do you plan to achieve that? That's a really good question. We have an innovation team within NHS England and Improvement. And it's important to say that that is quite a new team. 
So the programs, some of which I'm going to talk about, that now are managed by the innovation team actually used to sit with the strategy group that I belong to and we used to manage them because we managed them before the innovation team existed. But the NHS England and Improvement Innovation Team now manages a range of programmes that I can talk about aimed at uh, both accelerating research and innovation within the NHS, but then also accelerating the adoption of innovation within the NHS. And you might have heard about a group called the Accelerated Access Collaborative. That group is actually supported by the NHS England and Improvement Innovation Team. And the collaborative is a collaborative between both the NHS England and Improvement Organisation, as well as a number of different other national organisations, such as NICE, and then also the MHRA, which regulates medicines, as well as we, we also have the Academy of Medical Research. It's a good group to have for your collaborative. Yeah, exactly. The reason why it was formed was there was a recognition, um, similar to what I was talking about earlier, that the funding landscape for innovation is quite unclear. The Accelerated Access Collaborative was formed in order to try and better join up the activities of all of those organisations. And the aim is really to make the UK health system one of the most pro-innovation health systems in the world. On the issue of innovation, do you want to talk about the NHS testbed program? Yes, as I mentioned, um, the innovation team runs a range of different programs. The one that I personally have been involved in in the past is the NHS testbeds program. What that program is aimed at doing is filling the gap around real world testing of innovations and specifically digital health innovations. Because we know that things like drugs have a really quite clear pathway from research and development into uptake within the NHS. But things like a new health app or even sort of AI based <laughs> technologies, there isn't really that clear cut pathway. So we wanted to focus on digital health technologies in order to accelerate their adoption into the NHS. So what the NHS TestPeds program is about is taking digital health technologies that have a body of evidence around them that say that they are market ready, that say that they are safe and effective to a certain extent. So they have a reasonable amount of evidence about that but they haven't had the opportunity yet to be tested in a real world environment and with real world patient data, and particularly across multiple sites. So you might have an app that's been developed based on data from one hospital, for example, but the NHS Test Spurs program gives you the opportunity to test it in multiple hospitals and also potentially with other uh, digital health applications that might augment the impact of your innovation. I think that's really good for addressing sort of the scientific issues of clinical innovation, because the fact is clinical practice, you know, not only can it change from hospital to hospital or from trust to trust, you know, really it can change from even shift to shift. Yeah. The actual clinical implementation of best practices. Doug Altman, the uh, great British medical statistician, published quite a bit on the need to essentially validate your methods. He was mainly talking about statistical models for prognosis and diagnosis. Whenever you validate it, whether it's a drug or a new clinical practice or a new algorithm, it was always necessary that you need to test it across a larger number of clinical settings to make sure that it was robust in that way. Uh, very similar to how, you know, even in the better understood areas of medicinal clinical trials, you have a large number of sites and there is potentially a site effect that needs to be accounted for. So yeah, I think this is really great for people who might be more wary about the wider and the generalized applicability of, for example, machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms, that you have that larger test bed in which to try and to ensure that your implementations are robust. Let's keep talking about this if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I guess the aim of it is to build that evidence base around your digital health technologies to be able to have a sufficiently convincing evidence base to commission those technologies, thereby accelerating their adoption into the business as usual NHS. 
I think also a lot of the talk is about, you know, this machine learning and this algorithmic type of improvement or technologies. But, you know, all those are riding on the back of data architecture and data pipelines, the software interface with the clinician. And so mm-hmm. having that wider range of experience, you know, with just the actual the human element to it, it's not just improving the algorithm, it's actually improving the human experience with that technology. Yeah. Which of these hospitals are participating in sort of hospitals yeah. in contact with you? Will you develop it or yeah. what? I probably can't list off all of the hospitals or organizations that are participating. What I can do is give you an example to maybe bring it to life a little bit. Actually, I will start at the beginning as to how the innovators get onto the program to start with. We're currently in the second wave of the test beds program. What we did was we held a number of collaboration events where innovators could come and meet interested hospitals. It was a bit of a sort of speed dating matchmaking event where the different organizations got to meet each other and develop their proposal for what they wanted to do and how they wanted to test their digital health technologies in those real world hospital settings. So after those collaboration events, there was then an expression of interest and then finally quite a robust selection process to select seven testbed collaborations who were then funded in September last year. Those are seven sites across the country that are testing various different digital health technologies in their real world hospital settings. And the one that I'd like to talk about because I was involved in account managing them and supporting them for a little while is the testbed that's going on in the East Midlands where there's a collection of hospital trusts who have a data sharing agreement and an IT infrastructure system that allows them to share radiology images. So the testbed is currently testing out an artificial intelligence based algorithm that comes from a company called Chiron. And they're testing it out with some of the data from a couple of the uh, hospitals within the East Midlands. And they want to validate their algorithm and see whether it is actually as good as people in terms of detecting breast cancer within breast cancer screening images. It's really exciting because it involves artificial intelligence and everyone's excited about artificial intelligence, but it's a really tangible and useful use for it. We have a massive shortage at the moment of radiologists. So if this technology is then shown to be able to be as good as a radiologist in detecting breast cancer within those screening images, it means that we can use the technology to support the radiologists in their decision making and therefore plug some of those staffing gaps that we have. You're right. That is a good story. There's no doubt a lot of people who are going to be very interested in uh, trying to pursue this. So hopefully a lot more opportunities in the future. That sounds like a really great way to jump the hurdle of connecting innovators with the clinical staff who are willing to put some of the time and effort into working with them to develop their products. Yes, exactly. Chiron's a great example because they are a small to medium sized enterprise. It's often quite difficult for those kinds of organizations to break into the NHS and to find the right partners to help them to test their products. So that's why I think the Test Beds program is so great. I mean, it definitely is a challenge because sometimes it feels like you need to be part of a prestigious organization or just a really well-known company with a lot of clout already just to get people's attention. The fact is, it does make sense for clinicians to be skeptical. You know, they can't spend all their time testing every new digital solution that's out there. And, you know, there's a lot of people who might be peddling something that's less than useful or don't have the full drive or capability to see something all the way through. So a clinician can't spend their time trying out an invention for an innovator who isn't also going to put in the work to see it all the way through. Yeah, exactly. You definitely understand why they're skeptical, but at the same time for the innovators, it's like, I'm willing to put in the work. I just need someone to have the faith in me that they'll come and see it through as well. So hopefully that sounds like a program that will get to grow as much as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. You know, I really enjoyed this. Um, I think the audience will enjoy hearing about your work and the programs you're involved in. I think when people hear about your testbed program and your conference, they're going to get excited and want to get involved. So thanks for stopping by. And I really look forward to having you on a future episode. Well, thank you very much for having me on this podcast. It's great to have you and I hope to see you back. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of the Pod of Asclepius. 
We hope you enjoyed it and will tune in for our next episode. If you're watching from YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and leave a like. You can also follow us on our other social media channels, including LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. Have a great story or presentation that's ready for prime time? Or know someone who does? Drop Glenn an email because he'd be happy to hear from you. We would like to thank our sponsors from the American Statistical Association section on Statistical Learning and Data Science, section on Medical Devices and Diagnostics, and North Carolina Chapter, as well as the Institution of Engineering and Technology. The views expressed on the show are those of the speaker and not their employers, our sponsors, or anyone else not saying the words.